Welcome everybody. Hello. How are you all today? So as you are coming in, you are muted. Um, and we will try to keep folks muted during the um, program uh, because it's just easier for the interpreter to hear if only one person is speaking at a time. So we're just going to wait for a few more minutes because a lot of people are still coming in. This is a very popular one, Katie Hornberger. Not, not to put any pressure on you. Okay. Um, all right, just two more minutes, everybody. I just want to let everybody go in. Oh, Judy, I got the link to the webinar tomorrow, and I got everything. I got the link by Air Herschel and you, and I will be joining you at 1 o'clock tomorrow. At your oh, panelists. that's great. Good to know. Good okay. to know. All right. All right. That's, I think we have a critical mass of people. Welcome, everybody. My name is Judy Mark. I am president of Disability Voices United, who hosts the weekly SDP Connect calls. Uh, I'm also the parent of a self-determination participant um, who is served at Westside Regional Center. Uh, we, uh, we offer simultaneous translation in Spanish. So I'm just going to take a moment and ask Lorna um, to uh, tell folks in Spanish how you can find the back number to hear the translation. Go ahead, Lorna. Para las personas que hablan español, llamen al 551-241-6310 de nuevo. Para español, llamen al 551-241-6310. No necesitan código de acceso. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. And all of that information is also in the chat. Uh, so today um, we are having a discussion about fair hearings in the self-determination program. Um, I'm going to tell everybody how the um, how STP Connect generally works. Um, so we are a meeting, which means that everybody will have a chance to speak if they want. However, we're going to try to make it organized so people aren't speaking over each other. Uh, after Katie's presentation, we are going to ask you if you would like to ask her a question um, to use the raise hand feature. And you do that by clicking on participants on the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm gonna ask Connie Lapin to, um, to provide an example for this. And you click on participants at the bottom of the screen and then choose raise hand. So if those of you are seeing Connie, she will hopefully very soon have a little hand raised above her. Connie, can you I'm do that for us? A minute. Um, okay. Great. Judy, you didn't have a link, did you, today? A link to click on. I had trouble uh, getting on. Oh, yeah, I think that was missing. In yesterday's email, the link was there. But in today's email, you had to actually type in the Zoom meeting code. Sorry about that, folks. I, it, dumb me has to have every little trick I need. <laughs> okay. All right. So Connie has her hand up, and now we're and then we can lower her hand. Okay. Oh, no. 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 We're going to mute you all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, so um, what? So we are. So I don't want everybody to keep muted so that we don't hear what's going on in your home. Um, and we can actually hear the presentation, use the hand raise feature. If for some reason you cannot figure out the hand raise feature, you can go to the chat uh, and you can put in the chat a, um, you know, I'd like to speak and, and either Ed Herzl, our program assistant, or I will find that and I will call on you, okay? But it keeps the order and it, 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 it's actually really great. It's better than an in-person meeting. 
So, so I really want to thank Katie Hornberger for joining us today to talk about fair hearing in the self-determination program. I have heard from a number of folks that fair hearings are starting to creep up. And um, so we kind of want to provide some guidance. I'm also really interested in hearing how fair hearing goes. Um, I know that the first fair hearing I heard about was a long time ago, sometime last year. Um, by a friend whose son is a participant. And when he came in, the administrative law judge said to him, um, is th this self-determination thing, is this a fantasy of yours or is this real? So that just shows you that the judges aren't necessarily trained on the self-determination program. And so it is, uh, so, you know, there's, there's gonna be a learning curve on all of this and we wanna make sure people know what their rights are. So Katie Hornberger is the Director of the Office of Clients Rights Advocates at Disability Rights California. And I'm gonna let Katie take it away. Thanks, Katie. Great, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, Okay, so, um, you know, Judy said, can you talk about, you know, regional center hearings and self-determination? And I said, sure, I can talk about anything. And, um, which is generally my answer to, to any topic. Um, I, I will tell you, in many ways, fair hearings in self-determination should not be really any different than any other kind of regional center fair hearing. And, um, and so I don't want people to think that there is some sort of new process that exists. There isn't. It is the same process that existed before. And so um, the timing may be different of when you request one. And so um, we're going to go quickly over kind of overview of self-determination points. Um, the reason we're doing that is sort of points that you may be requesting a fair hearing. And then the fair hearing process, where to find information, and then I also have a section on information in your native language, uh, because I want to make sure that that people are uh, getting information in the language that they need, and that includes written information from their regional centers. So, uh, so to start, so you're all here because you're either in self-determination or you're hoping to get in. And uh, so it, it all starts with, and we've talked about this a lot on this call, um, person-centered planning. You're gonna develop your goals, your service needs. Then you're gonna develop the IPP that will implement the person-centered plan. You're gonna choose an FMS. I put the link to the vendor list. Um, we're gonna come up with your individual budget. I put a link to the individual budget tool at DDS. Um, so where you may run into sort of problems is it could happen in the very beginning. You could say, I want, you know, um, and, and I know Connie and Harvey um, well, and for a very long time, I met Harvey my first day almost 20 years ago as an employee of OCRA. And uh, so I can pick on them. I might say, I want Harvey to conduct my person-centered plan. And if the regional center tells me no, then we have a dispute. And I could actually request, and we're gonna talk about this, a notice of action, and I could go to fair hearing over who I want to do my person-centered plan. So really think about any time there's a dispute, this is your dispute resolution methodology. So it could happen then. Um, it could happen um, around your budget. And that's where thus far we have seen hearings. There are very few hearing decisions to date um, about self-determination, particularly if you're looking for people who were not in the preceding pilot program at the handful of regional centers that had it um, under the new program. I think we're at three hearing decisions that I could find. So not, not many yet. They were all about budgets. So um, that's where I think we're gonna see most hearings come up. So the regional center is gonna come up for a, with a budget for you. And that's gonna be based on um, the past expenditures in the preceding 12 month period. Uh, but um, it, could be, it could be that that budget needs to be changed 
And I actually think for a lot of people, that budget will need to be changed. I know for speaking for myself, my life looks very different today than it did 12 months ago. And I think that is true for most people. And so my needs have changed dramatically um, than what they were 12 months ago. And so there could be um, reasons that my budget should change. And that really starts off as a negotiation with the regional center, but ultimately you can end up in fair hearing over that. Uh, and that could be because the world is different, changed circumstances. It could also be because in my prior year, last year, I had needs that weren't being met. And I think that that is actually true for a lot of regional center clients that they had needs that weren't met last year for a variety of reasons. It could be that, um, that the, the money that we spent last year, it just doesn't meet my needs this year. And so, you know, um, there's lots of reasons you can have a dispute. It may be that the regional center is trying to decrease your budget alleging that a cost that you had last year, you don't have this year. And you might disagree with that. So that could be a reason for a dispute about budget. For people who are new to the regional center system, and I actually don't think that's gonna be any of you, there could be a dispute about how the budget is determined. Um, I think everyone that's in it now has been in the system probably for 12 months. Um, if there is agreement about a budget, the regional center will certify the budget um, and then move you in. Um, remember, the only things that they can buy are things that um, are eligible for federal matching. Sometimes it's how we frame things that is, is helpful. I think you've also talked about that on this call. Um, so. How does this all, this dispute resolution process, you know, start? It really starts with a notice of action. And that is an awkward phrase. I will say it does not roll off the tongue. Uh, but this is really the beginning. And the notice of action is written notice when the regional center makes a decision that you don't agree with. So that could be that they've made a decision to reduce your budget and you disagree. It could be that they, you have asked them to increase it and they have refused to increase it. Um, you know, outside of self-determination, you know, it could be that the regional center is changing, you know, terminating your eligibility or denying someone eligibility. And so, Anytime that happens and there's not agreement, they have to issue a notice of action. Your notice of action is a legal written notice. And think about other systems that you're involved in. Think about a lot of people get IHSS, for example, and home support services. And every year after your reassessment, you get that long, thin piece of paper in the mail, right? And it lists how many hours you're gonna get and on the back, it has all of your appeal rights. And it says, if you disagree with this, you know, call this phone number or mail something to this address, that's a notice of action. So every system sends these out. They just look a little different from system to system. The law is actually very clear about what that notice has to include. That doesn't change in self-determination. And so, uh, that little box. Um, okay, so it has to be in writing. Um, the regional center calling you and saying, oh no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. That does not constitute a notice of action. That's a, a, a phone call. That's nice of them to tell you. Maybe it gives you an opportunity to restate again why you're asking for what you're asking for, but that does not meet the legal requirement under the law. Uh, so I will say really um, technically you shouldn't have to ask for a written notice of action, but I have found 
that I do in real life. And sometimes that's because the service coordinator genuinely doesn't understand that there is a dispute because all of us are nice, polite people. And so I say, oh, you know what? I really need to increase my budget because, uh, you know, I'm gonna be going to school, you know, at community college and I never did that before. And it's gonna cost, I'm gonna have to buy books now. When I was in public, you know, high school, I didn't have to pay for books. My costs have gone up. And so I really need that. My service coordinator might say, oh, well, I'm sorry, we don't cover that. And then because I'm a nice, polite person, I say, oh, okay, right? And then in her records, she documents, um, told Katie no, Katie was okay with it, no further action. But I wasn't really okay with it, right? I was just being polite. And so this is where we all have to train ourselves. We can still be polite, but we have to be clear. And so instead of saying, oh, okay, what I have to remind myself to say is, I'm sorry we can't reach agreement on this. Can you please send me a notice of action? So that there is no possible misunderstanding about whether we had mutual consent or not. That's the language in the law. And so I do think sometimes there is very genuine confusion. I think the service coordinator very rightly could take my saying, oh, okay, as I came around to her way of thinking, off, you know, we're all fine. And, and so it, even though technically I don't have to use those magic words, in real life you do. And so I would really get comfortable saying, I'm sorry we can't reach agreement, please send me a notice of action. And sometimes what you find is that when you think about it later or um, after they send you a notice of action, maybe you really are okay with that decision. All that means is that then you don't file for hearing, right? But you've, you've had now more time to think about it and to understand their reasons why. So even though, like I said, legally, you shouldn't have to say those magic words, I find in real life, you have to say those magic words. So put a little sticky by your phone to remind yourself. Uh, and so then it's all clear, your service coordinator is gonna send you a notice of action. Under the law, the notice of action has to contain a whole list of things. And so in most regional centers, what you get is a letter with an attachment, a packet of information that actually contains most of what's required under the law. I think really some of the most important parts I've listed here at the beginning, which is what the regional center is going to do, um, the basic facts of why it's taking that action, um, when it's going to do it, the effective date, the law regulation or policy that they use to make that decision, and how to file an appeal. And, and the reason I think these are the most important parts are because sometimes a decision is made on incorrect information. And so they're going to say, oh, we don't pay for books when you go to community college because you should get those through Department of Rehab, right? But maybe I've already applied at Department of Rehab and they denied me eligibility. But Regional Center doesn't know that. So now, because of the notice of action, I know that they're missing a critical piece of information. I can tell them that. That might help us resolve the situation. So I think it's really important to understand why Regional Center is taking that action. Um, I also think it's important to understand the, the law, regulation, or policy that they're relying on, uh, because that gives you information about you know, how you better prepare your case to substantiate your need. In that same example, if they say, well, Department of Rehabilitation is your generic service provider, you should go to them, you know, and there is a law that says we have to use our generics, and that's true in self-determination also, 
that, you know, that gives me information that I need to really prepare my case to show that I've exhausted all of my generic resources. So that letter is very important and it's important to really read it and understand it. And then of course, it's where to file the appeal, your hearing rights, information on advocacy assistance, information about the process, um, and all that is good to know. Uh, it's gonna give you timelines. Uh, okay, and so that notice, that's really your starting point. So, and this is where it gets a little bit weird with self-determination, I have to tell you. So, and we don't know exactly how some of this is gonna work because we haven't figured it out yet. So in traditional regional center land, if I'm getting a service and regional center wants to reduce it, terminate it, or change it, they have to give me 30 days notice. And if I appeal my notice, uh, if I appeal it within 10 days, then I get what's called aid paid pending. This is another phrase that does not roll off the tongue. Uh, so, you know, make your sticky note of, of weird phrases that are important to remember. Aid paid pending is one of those. And this is another one that is, is happens in lots of service systems. And so it, it's a good one to learn about and to remember. Basically what aid paid pending means is, let's dissect it, aid, the help you're getting, paid, the service agency is going to keep paying for it pending until we get a hearing decision. So aid paid pending. Uh, that means you get to keep your services until you get a hearing decision. And the idea is that we don't want people going without services in case the decision was wrong. We would rather have a service agency pay for services that it's later determined that someone doesn't need than risk someone not getting the services that they really need while they're waiting for a hearing, right? And so that's why aid paid pending exists. So you would keep getting those services until you have a hearing decision and a judge decides whether you're gonna keep getting them or not. This is where it gets weird in self-determination, especially for people who are coming up on developing the initial budget. And so really what you're gonna be faced with in real life is as you're developing your initial budget, your aid paid pending is to remain in the current system and not transition. So if your dispute is I'm getting 40 hours a month of respite today, and they've told me that if I move into self-determination, they're only gonna give me the money equivalent of 20 hours of respite. My aid paid pending really means that I stay in the traditional system until we've resolved this budget dispute. That would be my aid paid pending. So once you're in self-determination, so a year from now, you've been in self-determination, you're happily moving along, you've had a budget, Regional center um, comes to you and says, oh, we're gonna reduce your budget for some reason. If you disagree with it, then, so remember this a year from now, then your aid paid pending is going to be what, what your current budget is um, that you'd been operating with in self-determination. So this transition time is a little bit hard and awkward um, to say the least. So, uh, Okay, so when we think about timing, if it's a new service, which I think in, in pretty much all of these cases where there's gonna be a budget dispute, that's what's gonna be happening, uh, the regional center has five days after a decision is made to send you the notice of action. So once, once you've gotten to that impasse, they have to send it to you within five days. And this is really important because you want to keep the process moving. And, you know, I'm, I actually believe in being polite. I don't, you know, many of you know me and have worked with me a lot over the years. I'm not one of those lawyers who pounds my fist on the table and screams. I don't, it's just not my way. 
um, what I do send is firm emails. Thank you for meeting with me. I look forward to, re you know, to receiving a response from you within five days. You know, I'll, I'll be waiting for your response on September 21st, right? Um, and then on September 21st, if I don't have a response, I send another email. You know, the five days permiss permissible under the law have, have expired now. I really need my notice of action. Please send it immediately. Right? And really what happens, I find a lot in real life, is that when you remind people of timelines, they are more apt to follow them. Uh, so I, I encourage you to put timelines in your correspondence. So, um, okay. So then you've got your notice of action. You've decided that you want to file for hearing. And so it includes a form and um, you can fill out that form. The law also requires that um, if people want help filling out the form, um, the regional center must help them fill out the form. Um, the law also requires that, um, you know, it, you don't have to use the form. You can write a letter requesting a hearing. Um, I find the form the easiest. Um, I also am a believer in keeping it simple. You don't have to write your life story on the form. Just one or two sentences about what the disagreement is about. Okay. Um, you have lots of rights, um, especially around records and access to your records um, so that you can see and understand the regional center's position better. Um, your notice of action has to be in the language um, that you speak or understand. And we'll talk more about language rights. Um, okay, so on the DDS webpage, the Department of Developmental Services, um, you can actually get a notice of um, proposed action form and you can get the um, hearing request form there. Uh, so um, you can see what those look like. Once you've filed for fair hearing, it starts with an informal meeting. And this is a meeting that you can or, or don't have to participate in. It's up to you. And so this is a meeting with um, the regional center director or someone acting on his or her behalf. In my experience, it is never actually the regional center director. It's always someone acting on their